Milton's Paradise Lost is the last great epic in the Western tradition. And we know that he had first intended to write an epic about the Arthurian legend. And Milton thought he could set his sights a little bit higher and write something with a more cosmic scope. And so he decided to write about the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The metaphysical poets came up with what are called conceits, that is analogies or metaphors that are unusual, that even take some work to figure out. They're creative, they're different, they're kind of mind-bending sometimes. Shakespeare has given us a play that shows justice opening up into mercy, the letter of the law being enforced so that mercy can season justice. The British Empire controls something like 75% of the land mass of the planet. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Liberty is all very well, but you cannot talk about whether, whether liberty is good or bad without saying when and for whom. The Romantic movement, a privileged instead of reason, emotion, intuition, imagination as sources for meaning, truth, and significance. The scientific revolution was really a continuation of Plato's project of describing the physical universe with mathematics. But it wasn't until Isaac Newton invented calculus that this Pythagorean Platonic project could really take off. Indeed, Newton was the culmination of the scientific revolution, and he was also the fulfillment of Plato's Pythagorean dream. Reason became the new authority, sometimes above the church and certainly above Aristotle. And so the scientific revolution of the 1600s sparked the enlightenment of the 1700s, an intellectual movement that has largely shaped our culture today. Dickens deliberately wanted to change people's hearts about how they treated people. And he used Christmas to make people be more sensible and sensitive to those around them. All of her novels are about the doings of people in the countryside and rural areas in England, their relationships, their small concerns on a small local level. But that's what makes them so delightful and so timeless. One of the reasons this is the most famous chapter in the story is because this sort of encapsulates what may be Dostoevsky's answer, his answer to the problem of evil. The answer doesn't come with our intellectual arguments. Remember what Edmund Burke said about the wisdom that comes from generations upon generations, from a nation or a culture growing slowly over time and developing a wisdom that's greater in its cumulative size than any one human lifetime could ever achieve. In-person conventions are canceled this year, so we are bringing the convention to your home. April 20th through 27th, enjoy all the deepest discounts we normally reserve for conferences and conventions, including free shipping. During the sale, we will also feature full lectures from Old Western Culture, as well as a virtual booth time, live videos where we will discuss our products and answer questions in real time. Get all the details at romanroadsmedia.com. All right, welcome back to Old Western Culture and our study of the Enlightenment. Today what we'll be talking about, or who we'll be talking about, is Sir Isaac Newton. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to review some of the things that we've learned about the scientific revolution and uh, relate it to the problem of change that we've been following throughout this series. Remember that uh, since the ancient Greeks, uh, humans have been trying to solve this problem of change. There's all of this, uh, all the different objects and things in the world, and they're moving and they're changing from one thing to another. And 
what we've been trying to do as humans is to explain what's going on behind the scenes. And so one way to do that is to, to simplify uh, and unify the way we've done that. One of the ways that we've done that con in, in our contemporary world is to say, look, everything that we see uh, physically is made up of these fundamental particles like electrons and neutrons and protons. And that's, that's a real big simplification. And um, this is what the ancients were trying to do. And this is what we've been trying to do since then. The scientific revolution was part of that, trying to look at the, the problem of motion, the problem of change. And um, w w in fact, we, we saw that the, the scholastics, um, going back to Aristotle, had this uh, little motto that uh, summarized the importance of this. Uh, ig ignorance of motion is ignorance of nature. So you have to understand motion, you have to understand change if you're going to understand the world around you. Now the scientific revolution is really just a part of us solving that or trying to solve that problem of change. Um, and remember a revolution is an overthrowing, so it's an overthrowing of someone or something and we saw that it was an overthrowing of Aristotle, the Aristotelian uh, science. There were two components to the scientific revolution, uh, the, the two main components. The first one was the revival of this Pythagoreanism, this Platonism, this view that the world, the cosmos, is ultimately mathematical. So everything, can, everything is fundamentally mathematical, at least when it comes to the physical world. The second part was the mechanical philosophy. We saw a little bit of that when we talked about Descartes. And remember, mechanical has to do, when you think mechanical, you think forces that come into contact with one another, and there's these pushes and pulls. Now, one way to maybe uh, for, to help you memorize these two uh, parts of the scientific revolution is just to think for the first one, the mathematical part, the Pythagoreanism, the Platonism. And then the second, is the mechanical part. So you have these two M's, nice alliteration there, uh, but that'll help you to remember those two, two aspects of it. So today we'll look at Newton and we'll look at and see how Newton contributed to these and how he uh, moved the ball down the field. And we're actually gonna see that when the revolution is complete, it's gonna be Newton standing on the throne or sitting on the throne. He'll be, he'll be the one that replaces Aristotle. So, Real brief overview or intro to um, Isaac Newton, uh, his, his dates. He was born in 1642, which is the same year that Galileo uh, died. So 1642, he died in 1727. He was born on Christmas Day in England uh, in Woolsthorpe, which means sheep farm, uh, his uh, private manor. Uh, he, wrote, he wrote on a wide variety of subjects. He's one of these Renaissance men. It was amazing how broadly he um, studied and became actually experts in many of these fields that he wrote on. One was mathematics. He wrote on uh, optics and light, the nature of light, physics, obviously, which we'll talk more about today. But he also studied a lot of chemistry, or what was at the time called alchemy still. Uh, and that was really something that he was interested in, that uh, uh, fascinated by and wrote quite a bit about. Yet, despite all of that he wrote on all of those topics, he wrote more on theology than he did on any other subject. He was a devout Christian, very serious about the faith, about a personal faith, a personal relationship with uh, God. Not only that, but his faith, his and we'll talk more about this in a bit, his belief in God and a designer was really what motivated him in his uh, study of nature. And we'll, we'll talk about that, and that's, that's really important. So let's, let's look at how he contributed to these two things. First, the mat mathematical part, the Pythagoreanism aspect. Uh, remember uh, I said that Descartes wrote 
a book, you know, the book that he wanted to kind of be the textbook that overthrows or, or replaces the Aristotelian corpus when it came to natural philosophy. And it was the, the principles of philosophy. The principles of philosophy. Well, uh, Newton writes a book that's going to be the most important book in the history of science, perhaps. And he plays off of Descartes' title. Newton calls it this. The mathematical principles of natural philosophy. So here, notice these two words that he inserts into that, uh, that title. So Descartes had the principles of philosophy. Newton's work is really kind of a reaction, in a sense, to the Cartesian philo uh, philosophy. He adds this other aspect. Look, we're going to talk about the mathematical principles, not just of philosophy in general, but of natural philosophy. He's going to focus on the natural world, and this is what he does. So, so keep in mind that this is a little pushback, or actually probably a big pushback, against the Cartesian world. But notice it's this mathematical, he's very, he's very, very clear about focusing on the mathematical aspects of philosophy. This, he published this in 1687. This is a, the, at least the first edition. That's a good um, date for you to remember. Make sure you remember 1687. Now here's what he did. Again, we're, we're talking about the mathematical aspect of Newton and his contribution to the scientific revolution. Here's what he did. The mathematics, you need fairly complicated mathematics in order to characterize things that are moving and moving quickly. So when you drop an object and you want, it's, it moves real fast. If you try to time it with a timer, with just a, it's really difficult to do. So how to characterize that with mathematics, there just wasn't, before Newton, there wasn't really the mathematical tools to do that. Um, so he invents it. So he actually invents mathematics to deal with the problem of change. So when it comes to the mathematical aspect, he's really doing something very innovative, inter inventing calculus. All right, so he's inventing calculus in order to solve some of the problems of change. Now, real briefly, what I want to do is uh, everyone should study calculus to some degree. Um, I, 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 but let me give you this uh, real brief uh, explanation of what's going on, why, why it was needed. Um, think about this. So we're talking about the problem of change or motion. Remember, distance equals rate times time. Or rate equals the distance divided by time. Another word for this is just speed. Fair enough, this is easy, this is not. Imagine I'm on a car trip. I go from here to here. It's 100 miles, okay, from here to here. And let's say it takes me two hours to drive it. Okay, now my rate over this trip is going to be the distance divided by the time. Well, that's 100 miles divided by two hours, so that ends up being 50 miles per hour. Now. Am I moving, does this, if you do this calculation, does that mean that I'm moving at 50 miles an hour throughout this whole trip? Not necessarily, it could, I mean, maybe I did, but imagine I was 
I started out real slow and I did about 30 miles an hour. Then all of a sudden I sped up to 100 miles an hour. I mean, it's still a 30 mile per hour zone, but I speed up to 100 miles an hour. And I get pulled over. And the police officer rightly says, you know, the, the, you're speeding, you ought not do this, um, you're, you're in trouble. In fact, you're probably going to jail because it was such a, a, you're speeding so fast. And I say, hold on, officer, I can totally explain. My average speed over my trip was going to be 50 miles an hour. So I'm great. I, I, I calculated it such that I would go 30, I was going to go 100, and then I was going to drop back down. My average speed was 50 miles an hour. He would probably put me in, the, in his police car in the back for being a smart aleck. That's not going to fly. He wants to know, and this is what's important, what am I, how fast am I going now? He wants to know when he points that radar at me, how fast am I going now? Because it really does matter how fast I'm going when I say fly off the road or I hit another car. At that instant, that's the important speed. So that's what he wants. So you want, you want the speed at an instant. Well, what's the, what's the, how fast, what's the time that, that traverses during an instant? No time at all. How, how far do I actually travel in an instant? I don't travel any distance in an instant. So what happens is at that very instant, at, an, at any instant that I'm traveling, it's really... I get this, zero over zero. And you don't need to know a lot of math to know that this is bad. At the very least, you have zero miles an hour, but it's worse. You have zero over zero, which is, speaking of illegal, mathematically illegal. So we need some way to be able to calculate speed at a particular instant, one that doesn't get us into trouble. And that's what calculus does. So, and that's one of the many things that calculus does, but that's why we need it. Because otherwise, our very concept of speed, which is what motion is based on, is incoherent. You can't have instantaneous speed. So there you go. Next time you have a problem that you need to solve, you can invent the mathematics yourself, just like Newton. Now, this is a huge contribution uh, when you talk about this mathematical contribution because we actually today could not do most of our physics without some sort of calculus. It's, it's um, the innovation, the, 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 the importance of this can't be stressed enough. Now, the next thing, the mechanical part, the mechanical philosophy. Des, uh, Newton, like Descartes, believed that matter was made up of atoms, or what they called corpuscles. Uh, in fact, Newton even believed that light was made up of these particles, or corpuscles, which no one believed, and no one really believed until the 20th century when Newton was vindicated. Everyone else at the time, and following him, thought that light was a wave. Turns out that it's a particle and a wave. Now, these particles, not just of, so the, the particles of matter, the stuff that everything's made out of, this, these little, think of them as little BBs. You can't really, you can't see them. They're so small. You can't see them individually. But there are these little bits of matter, and they're inert. That, that is, they don't have spooky, mysterious natures like the Aristotelians thought. Now, Descartes was very similar. He thought that you had matter and there was nothing, nothing internal to it that made it move. So, how do these objects move? Well, they move, so when you drop, an, when you drop something and it falls, these objects move because there's an external force being applied to it. It's not an internal force that's moving it, causing it to want to go to the center of the cosmos. It's something external pulling on it or pushing on it, but it's an external force. So that's the key, an external force as opposed to an internal 
force. So you have these internal causes, these forces, and this is a real big part of Newton's principia. We're going to call the, and this is what it's often called, the mathematical uh, pr uh, principles of natural philosophy is often just called the principia. That's what we'll do. Now, in the principia, what Newton does is he has this entire physics of these external forces. So this is a big deal. So if, if everything's being moved, if this matter, this inert matter is being moved, pushed and pulled around by it, um, these forces, these external forces, you'd like a description of how those forces work. And that's exactly what the Principia does and what physics does by and large. So he has um, laws, you've heard of Newton's laws of motion maybe, and his law of universal gravitation. What I'm gonna do, uh, just, the, just to give you an idea so you know what the three laws are. Uh, the, the three laws Newton's three laws of motion actually form his axioms for the Principia. Remember we had this foundationalism that looks like this. And in here, you have the things that you just assume and the things that you build up from here, the other propositions. Well, the three laws of motion go in Newton's foundation. Now, he didn't just assume them. He had to use all kinds of, do all kinds of experimentation and thought experiments and everything in order to come up with these three laws of motion. I'll go through these real quickly. Um, the first one is the law of inertia. Uh, we saw this with Descartes, an object in motion or at rest, will stay in motion or at rest unless it's acted on by some external force. Again, there's the external force, but you don't need a cause to keep it pushing. If you're out in space and you throw something, it just keeps going forever in a straight line unless it gets in, it comes in contact with some gravitational, some sort of force. So that's the first one, law of inertia. The second one is the F equals MA. You've probably seen that. Uh, that just describes how objects change or how they accelerate. They change direction or change speed based on forces. F equals MA. And then the third one is the uh, famous for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. When I, let's say I'm leaning on this, I'll be careful not to do that too much, but I'm leaning on this. My hand is putting a force on this chalkboard. So it applies a force, but at the same time, the chalkboard is applying an equal and opposite force to my hand. So there's this, the, the forces a lot of times they'll come in pairs like this. So that, that's, the, that's the third law of motion. Okay, so those are the, the laws of, of motion, but there's another law that's really important. I wanna look a bit more about this. Remember, we're, we're talking about the mechanical aspect, these external forces acting on this inert matter. All these laws of motion are part of this mechanical aspect and part of the mathematical aspect insofar as he, Newton uses mathematics to describe these things. Even F equals MA, you know, that's a mathematical formula, that's a mathematical statement. But let's talk about the law of universal gravitation. All right, now you're probably familiar with the fact that Newton came up with this law of gravity. I mean, you think, when you think about, you know, you think about, when you think about Newton, you think about an apple and an apple falling on his head. It actually didn't happen that way, though an apple did give him, when he's looking out at his orchard, um, it actually does, he sees an apple fall or a few apples fall, and it gives him this idea didn't fall on his, the apple didn't fall on his head, but it did give him this idea. In fact, Voltaire, uh, we'll talk briefly about him a bit later, uh, he's the one that kind of made that uh, story famous. So, remember, falling objects, they can no longer be explained by 
internal causes or these mysterious natures. So there's got to be something else that causes them to fall. And so that's, what, that's one of the problems that Newton sets out to solve. Some people think it's magnetism. He, he doesn't uh, or ends up not thinking that it's magnetism. He comes up with this notion of gravity. And so what he did is he, he noticed that, so, and this is, this is either cra pure crazy or pure genius. He notices the, an apple fall and he says, you know what? The same thing that causes that apple to fall towards the ground is the same thing that causes the moon to stay in orbit around the earth. Now, other than like the roundness of like an apple and the moon, they don't look like they're behaving the same way. It doesn't even look like the earth, the, the moon is moving, but he makes this connection and it's entirely right. But it's not obvious at all that the two are the same. But these, the, the, the falling object and the orbit of the moon is caused by the same thing. Now the law, again, where you can describe this mathematically, is this. The force of gravity is equal to, this is just a constant, the mass of one object and the mass of the second divided by the distance or the radius between them. So this could be, let's say this is the moon, this is the earth, and then this is the distance between the centers of the two. You can get the force of gravity from this equation. So this describes really well how gravity affects objects. Now here's, here's something that's amazing. Notice this word, universal. What uh, Newton is saying is he's saying that this applies for any two objects with mass at all. Between you and your computer, you and the earth, you and the moon, any two objects, this works for it. Now sometimes the, the force is so weak between like you and your computer that the, the force between you and the earth far overpowers that. But this is amazing. Universal. It means it applies to everything, everywhere in the universe. So whether you're talking about an apple falling or you're talking about Pluto in its orbit around the sun, same formula. Remember that there used to be, before Newton, this, and before Galileo, this terrestrial celestial division in the cosmos. So you had the, the earthly realm and you had the celestial or heavenly realm. And they, they were made of different stuff. And so they behaved differently and they behaved by way of different laws. Well, Galileo was one person that, no, no, they don't. This, this, it's, they don't behave by different laws. There isn't this division. In fact, it's the earth that's moving around the sun well, Gal, um, Newton comes along and he actually comes up with mathematics, physics that applies to the earthly realm, the terrestrial realm, and the celestial realm. Here's what he does. He unifies. He puts the uni in universe. So he really takes all this diversity and makes it into this universe. And now you only need one set of of laws. You don't need two books, like here's my celestial book and here's my terrestrial physics book. They can be a single book. That's so powerful. Remember, the goal of when we're trying to solve this problem of change is to simplify, which we just, we've done, now one book, one set of laws, and unify. They're one. This, this is really, really powerful. This is um, taking this, uh, I mean, Newton is putting his money where his mouth is. He's not just saying that it's one realm. He actually shows that it is. So we can study a, the motion of a cannonball on Earth, and that can tell us, that experiment, that observation can tell us something about, say, the orbit of Mercury. You can do experiments here that tell you about celestial things. 
Now, so this mechanical philosophy of external pushes and pulls in terms of mathematics is, is really pretty amazing. We're used to it, so we're not, we're not shocked by it anymore, but we ought to be. Again, think of the mechanical aspect of this. Uh, no longer are you thinking of the world as an organism, this living thing. You're thinking of it as a machine, a clock, let's say with gears that interact by these external forces. Now, what's more complicated, a clock or an organism? Well, think about how hard it is, would be to make a living organism versus how hard it is to make a clock. Well, we've made clocks. We, making a machine, understanding a machine is way, way simpler, way easier than understanding an, a, a living organism. And so what that does is, what, again, this is a simplification. It's, the universe is not as complicated in terms of, at least, physics as it once was thought to be. It doesn't have mysterious natures. It doesn't have, it's mechanical, simple, made out of stuff that behaves in terms of these forces. At least that's the view of this time when it, around the time of the scientific revolution. So we have a much better chance of understanding the world. But there's something, Newton's going to throw a little bit of a wrench in that, in this way. When it comes to his very idea of gravity, he gets a lot of flack for this concept of gravity. And you think, well, why? This is like, I mean, we use this today. Well, here's the problem. The problem is that for Newton, you had, let's say, the Earth and the Moon attracting one another by this gravitational force or something. Notice that they're not in contact with one another. Remember, the essence of mechanical philosophy is this the, the uh, matter being, com being in contact with one another, pushing and pulling. But on Newton's view, you have the Earth and you have you have the Earth and you have the Moon. They're not in contact with each other at all. There's nothing invisible. There's no invisible string or rope or anything like that. They are acting on one another, totally at a distance. They're not touching each other at all. This is really this action at a distance is something that is, goes entirely against the mechanical view. And so Newton's instantly criticized for this. What are you trying to, you're going back to these natures or, or what is it? You're, you're taking this back, you're backsliding into scholasticism or into Aristotelianism. And so some people like Leibniz, the famous uh, philosopher and mathematician, gives him all kind, gives Newton all kinds of grief for having what they call occult or hidden powers. So Newton's really cutting against the grain when it comes to this mechanical philosophy. Notice he doesn't think like um, Descartes thought that the moon was moving around in this kind of whirlpool of ether. Newton doesn't believe that at all. He says there's no ether. There is no ether. It's empty space. And there's, there's this action at a distance now, and that seem, that, that's so counterintuitive. The, the whirlpool metaphor is much easier to understand. You go, oh yeah, no, I totally know how that's working. But the action at a distance, we don't. In fact, Newton even suggests somewhere, in some places, it seems like he's talking about matter having these internal or active principles. Now that really seems like it's almost going back to something like a nature or something. It's like there's something inside the stuff. And he says, he's, look, there, there might be these active principles. Now ultimately he thinks God's causing motion. So he, just like Descartes did, um, but God uses these secondary means, and there could be this stuff that he put into uh, matter that makes them behave the way they do. 
In fact, he may have gotten this idea from uh, alchemy, from as he looks at substances interacting with one another. Anyways, the, notice that this goes against the mechanical philosophy, and it gives this push. But it's hard to it's hard to argue against success, and so eventually people say, you know what, this just work. I mean, it's hard to deny that this works, so it's hard to deny what Newton is doing. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the concept of gravity and remember the observation theory distinction. The Flammarion engraving. Remember the guys looking through the, uh, the appearances, trying to look behind the scenes, behind the veil. And so he's trying to look beyond the observations to figure out what's causing it to look like this. Well, the, 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 our story of what's going on behind the scenes, we can't see it. We can't, ever, we can't actually go behind the veil. So what we have to do is we have to come up with a story or a theory about why things look this way. Now, what does that have to do with gravity? Well, notice, and, and Newton noticed this, you can't observe gravity. You can observe objects behaving a certain way, but you can't observe gravity. You can observe, let's say gravity is this thing, you can observe the effects of gravity, but not gravity itself. So when, when people ask them, so what, what, what is this gravity? What's causing gravity? Uh, Newton has this famous phrase. Uh, in Latin, it was, Hypothesis non fingo. I feign no hypotheses. I frame no hypotheses or theories. I'm not going to tell you what's going on behind the veil, behind the observations, because I don't know. So I'm not even going to attempt. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an equation that tells you how the things we observe behave. But I can't give you a theory. I can't give you, I can't tell you what's going on behind the scenes. And so when it comes to gravity, I really don't have a theory. Now, the fact that you can't observe gravity is going to be very important for the Enlightenment thinkers like David Hume and Immanuel Kant, whom we're going to talk about uh, in, in a couple of, in a lecture or two. Um, so I want you to keep in mind that, look, the only thing we see are these objects moving. Now, one thing to note is that Gal uh, Newton was not worried about the skeptical question like Descartes was. He just totally ignored it. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, um, he didn't address it at all. And he just went ahead with his assume that since perception works, assumes that we're not assume that we're not a computer simulation, that we're not dreaming, that there's no evil genius, all of that. He he just doesn't even address the problem. But we're going to see that people after him do. Now, as I said, Newton. I mean, Newton did think that God was the ultimate cause of motion and things behind that, but that wasn't part of his scientific theory, he couldn't say, well, I've seen God, or I've, um, I know that God is causing gravity directly. What, but what he does, speaking of God, he does think that looking at nature can give you an idea, it can help you to know that God exists. So not necessarily just the gravitational part, but when you look at the order of mathemat I mean the order of the world. It's mathematically ordered. It's, I mean, look at the a, a complex biological organisms. Newton points to these things and says, look, you, there's got to be some divine mind behind these. Again, uh, go back to the Pythagorean view, the Pythagorean Platonic view. I said um, at the beginning of our series that there were these three Pythagorean beliefs. And the famous mathematical historian Morris Klein says, 
look, this is what these guys in the scientific revolution believed, including Newton. Remember what they are. One, the universe is ordered by perfect mathematical laws. Two, divine reason is the organizer of nature. It didn't just happen. Divine reason organized it. And then three, and this is, this is important, human reason can understand this divine pattern. Now you really do, and I would argue, I won't argue this here, but I, I, I think that you actually need something like this in order to have any sort of science or physics at all. And certainly Newton and the other um, scientists of the scientific revolution thought that also. Okay, now Newton really is the instigator in many ways of the Enlightenment of the 1700s. Now the Enlightenment, we can't really say that it started exactly in the 1700s. It was starting to gain speed even with Descartes, and you'll see that Descartes had some, he was part of the problem as well insofar that the Enlightenment was a problem. I think we can learn some things from the Enlightenment, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Why did Newton inspire the Enlightenment? Well, think back, the problem of change, remember Plato's homework problem. Plato said, look, I want you to, I want you to characterize the universe or the, the heavens with mathematical laws. Look what Newton does. He characterize, characterizes the universe with these mathematical laws. Now that's, I mean, he, he fulfills the Pythagorean Platonic dream in a way that those, the ancients never ever could have imagined. So this is something, something that they would be amazed at. And so Newton, and everyone was at the time, Newton was a hero, and rightly so. In fact, he probably was the most, imp most famous person in Europe, at least one of them. But he was, a, he was a prime example of what humans could do by way of reason. Look, he unlocked so many of the secrets to the universe by using mathematics, something that you do with your mind. And he was seen as kind of rescuing humans from the darkness of ignorance. Remember, we're talking about enlightenment. Listen to what Alexander Pope wrote. He wrote this as an epitaph for Newton. He says this, Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. So notice that, that, that idea of light coming into a dark world. Now, if you're paying attention, you, you remember that actually the Bible talks about Jesus in that way. And there's this actual connection that some people are making with Jesus and Newton. Which, I mean, it seems, seems wild, but people were doing that. So, so Newton kind of had this messianic rescuing um, notion surrounding him. Here's what uh, Lord Byron wrote in Don Juan. See if you can hear the messianic tones. When Newton saw an apple fall, he found in that slight startle from his contemplation... Tis said, for I'll not answer above ground for any sage's creed or calculation, a mode of proving that the earth turned round in a most natural world called gravitation. And this is the sole mortal who could grapple since Adam with a fall or with an apple. Man fell with apples and with apples rose. If this be true, for we must deem the mode in which Sir Isaac Newton could disclose. So notice what they're saying there. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you got this. Um, for Christians, the person who deals with Adam's fall is Jesus. Well, according to Byron and, and, uh, and some other folks in the Enlightenment, the person who dealt, the first person who could deal with Adam's fall, the 
who could grapple with an apple is Newton himself. Now, people like Voltaire and David Hume are going to pick up on this and they're going to actually go throughout the world. They're going to write and kind of spread this Newtonian gospel to, help, to, to free humankind from their dark uh, uh, bondage. Now, of course, Newton would be rolling over in his grave if he lived to see what was going on. But anyways, it's a, people took this as this call to reason. Immanuel Kant's going to do this. David Hume is going to do this. And remember that the, the, the Enlightenment's called the Age of Reason. I want to, I want to close with uh, some thoughts on that. So remember the, the Enlightenment we said uh, at the beginning? It was a turn from traditional authority like Christianity and um, Aristotle to reason. And we summarized that. We actually made that even shorter by saying it was a turn from religion to reason. And we recall that Immanuel Kant, his, uh, his essay on the Enlightenment or what is Enlightenment, he said that Enlightenment is man's release from his self-imposed tutelage. He's listening to authorities like Aristotle, um, the church, your pastor, your parents. You need to think for yourself. You need to grow up and you need to think for yourself. And this is what they saw Newton doing. Humanity growing up and thinking for itself. So who can we trust? Well, look, we now are able to, looks like Newton's pretty reliable. And what was he using? He was using reason. He was using mathematics. I mean, that's, that's, the proof is in the pudding. So you can trust that. Now, I want to say, yes, it was an age of reason. But remember, and we're going to see this when it comes to David Hume in the next lecture, sense perception was also important. So it wasn't just like an age of reason. It was an age of our cognitive abilities sense perception and reason of looking look for yourself don't just don't just listen to my word look think for yourself look for yourself so when we hear age of reason what i want you to think is i want you to think that it's not just reason but it's not just yay reason it's yay cognitive faculties yay human abilities and so that's really what um you know, we can use age of reason, but I want us to remember that it's our, our sense perception and reason as well. And we're going to see David Hume emphasizes reason in our next lecture. What I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you read a few excerpts from Newton's Principia. It's a, one of the most difficult works ever to read. So we're just going to read a, a few things, just see some examples of his laws of motion and his gravity, uh, law of gravity. And then we'll read some of his, what's called his general scolium. Um, it's a famous passage where he's talking much more about general principles, and, and it'll be good for you to read that. And then um, a couple of selections from his book, The Optics. And again, these are from these are just selections, but I want you to see when he's talking about uh, God's existence and things like that, some of the less technical aspects of it, it will help you to have read that. So we'll see you next time, and we'll look when we'll look at David Hume. In-person conventions are canceled this year, so we are bringing the convention to your home. April 20th through 27th, enjoy all the deepest discounts we normally reserve for conferences and conventions, including free shipping. During the sale, we will also feature full lectures from Old Western Culture, as well as a virtual booth time, live videos where we will discuss our products and answer questions in real time. Get all the details at romanroadsmedia.com.